gentlemen, following our introduction to uh, the Cummins at Darlington plant, we're now going to actually get on the shop floor and we're going to find all about how the engines are actually produced. So to do that, we've got Mr Andy Mason here. So Andy, I mean, first of all, just tell us what's your role here at Cummins yeah, at Darlington? Yeah, so I'm manufacturing engineering leader for the Darlington campus. Right. So I've been here about 16 years now, um, variety of different roles. So you've been doing it a minute to two then, yeah? Yeah, a, a, a little <laughs> bit of time, yeah. It's, uh, That's yeah. it. So what's actually involved in your sort of current role? So in my current role, I manage kind of all the engineering function across the shop floor. So that's the day-to-day the -day team that support all the production processes. Um, I've got people like the controls guys who do all the, the robot programming and the PLC programming. Uh, I've got the guys who introduce the new products to the production line uh, and then manage all the major projects, capital investment uh, and all that kind of thing as well. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's quite a, quite a broad scope. It's a, a good say, enough to keep yeah, you busy then. It definitely keeps me busy, yeah. That's it definitely it. keeps me busy. Right, let's, so let's get stuck into yeah. this, you know, how you guys build your engines here at yeah, Darlington. Sure. So, I mean, just kick us off with, I mean, effectively, step one. Where do the materials come from, the components, all that yeah, kind of thing? Yeah, so the, materi the materials that go into the engines, they, they literally come from all over the world. So uh, some of them are coming supplied, some of them are from external suppliers, uh, but they come from the four corners of the globe. So uh, we've got blocks and, and heads and things come from Brazil and Rocky Mountain in the US. Uh, we've got parts that come from India, parts that come from China, and then a lot of it's sourced in Europe and, and the UK as well. So uh, it really is a global supply chain. Uh, that, that we then assemble together in the, into the finished product. But actually a lot, of the, a lot of the major components, things like blocks and heads, they're actually manufactured and machined by Cummins anyway internally. Right. So, so we have very, very close relationships with them. Um, companies that supply us with the crankshafts and things like that, they come from some um, from Jamestown uh, with camshafts and things like that. So that's, a, that's another Cummins facility. Um, but then some of the other, other components come from suppliers like Tissen Krupp and other places like that and, and we have, we have long-standing relationships. That's it. Well that's it, they're big yeah. steel works aren't yeah, they? Exactly. Yeah. So how many, I mean obviously you produce a hell of a lot of engines do, per yes. day, per yeah. year. Yeah. So how many components would you get coming in like, per week? Yeah, oh, in terms of components coming in a week, I mean it's, it's a lot. I mean we, we basically, we've got a number of different warehouses locally that we use. So there's one at Teesport. Uh, there's a Cummins warehouse called UKLC, which is uh, down in the Midlands, uh, and we, we bring the, the material in as, as and when we need it from those, those places. So we tend to have a truck arrive in every hour full of material that, that supplies our build, so wow. uh, it's, it's a continual process yeah. and obviously those are then going back out. Um, things like blocks, um, we bring those in in the containers, um, they, they'll sit here. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a huge quantity of material comes into the site. I was going to say, place. logistically, yeah. it just must be monumental. Yeah. I mean, each, each engine's got literally hundreds and hundreds of components in it. And it depends on, it depends on the product, but it, you know, you're talking in the, the two, three, four hundred components. Per uh, engine. Per engine, right. per engine. So it's, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of parts are going into these things. Yeah. Um, and, and obviously the logistics behind it is, is pretty significant. So. That's it. So once we've got the components here, Yep. We kind of, I suppose you could say, this is sort of the first it is. step towards it is. the production yep. of an engine. So just explain what's going yeah, on here. So, so the first thing that happens at this stage here is, uh, th these are the engine blocks. So these are coming in from, uh, they could be from Brazil, they could be from the US, could be from China. Um, and what we do is we wash them. So we've got a, a block wash. Um, and you know that basically gets rid of any preservative oils, any bits of swarf or sand castings that have, have kind of come to the surface that may affect the sealing performance of the block. Yeah. Um, so that we wash them. Uh, these are then in line set sequence. So this is basically the next engine to go into build, to go into the production process. Uh, and what we do here is we lift it on with this manipulator. We lift it onto the, the main production line, which is just behind you there. Uh, and we, we write the engine serial number onto an RFID tag, which yeah. is actually in the pallet. Uh, that serial number stays with the engine for its, its entire that's life. It, that's its yeah. passport, basically. And then as it travels through the process, the RFID tag is read by our, our control systems. It goes up to the servers and the servers come down and tell the operator what to fit or they tell the robots what, what program to run and, yeah. and so that's it, the kind of same process throughout the, the plant. Yeah. So every single station around the around yep. the shop floor it will be right this is this engine yep. this is what needs yep. to be on it at this point. Yep. It knows exactly what engine it is, it knows what customer it's going to uh, and it knows you know every component that should be fitted at that workstation. Yeah. Uh, it also controls things like fail safing to make sure the operators have used the right the right tools, they pick the right parts. Um, all that kind of stuff as well. It's right. controlled through that. So perfect. It's a, well, no it's a pretty complex system. I've got to say, no um, doubt we'll get into a bit more of that as we go around. Yeah, but, definitely. I mean, looking at the, you know, these blocks here as we see them. Obviously, they've had a lot of machining done to them they already. Have, yeah. 
So these are, once we've been cleaned, these are ready to be yeah. assembled, are they? That is, that is it, yes. Yeah. So they, these are fully machined when they're coming from the, uh, when they're coming from the supplier um, and they're ready to go. So that, that's it, it's, it's ready to become an engine. Right, perfect. Well, we'll, we'll go and have a look at the next yeah. step, shall we? Sure. The, so the, the first step, mm -hmm. the washing process, where are we at now? Yeah, so th this is, this is uh, known as the short block line, and this is really where the engine internals go, go into the block. Um, so this is where all the performance parts, or most of the performance parts are going in, uh, the kind of bigger pieces of metal. So here we've got the crankshaft. Yeah. Um, that's actually loaded on by, by that robot that you can see behind you. Um, and that was a new piece of uh, automation that went in in August last year. Uh, we've also, interesting, we've integrated some, uh, some material handling robots into that as well. So these now come directly from the warehouse, come in in sequence, the robot picks the right one out and it drops it in the engine. Right. Um, so these little trolleys we yeah. see just wandering around on their own, yeah. it's not a random thing. No, they, they, know, they know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're intelligent, they've got sensors all around them, so yeah. if, you, if you walk in front of it, it'll stop. Uh, if you stay stopped, it'll go around you. Yeah. Um, and it's all programmed it through Wi-Fi and it knows the, the building coordinates, so right. uh, they're pretty autonomous um, and yeah, good bits of kit that we've, we've just started introducing, so it's been, it. it's been challenging at times, but yeah. um, it always is when you put new stuff in. So well, That's it, and like I say, you've got lots of automation now, you've got these autonomous have, trolleys, you've got the robots behind yeah. us there. And, and then the other thing we've got in the background, and, and whether you can see it on the video or not, uh, we've got some collaborative robots, so these are, these are the white and green robots that you can see dotted around the process. Uh, what's interesting about these is, as opposed to traditional automation where you have to put it behind a cage, yeah. uh, these are actually safe for people to work with, so they work uh, side by side with the operator. So the one behind you there, that starts to tighten the, uh, the main bearing bolts down. Yeah. Um, that actually follows the operator along, as the operator puts the bearing caps on, it follows him along and starts, starts the process. So these don't replace people, these work in conjunction with people, right. help us work safer, help us work quicker, yeah. uh, and more importantly, they, they improve the quality so as well. So how do the they product. know, like, you've got your operator there, he's yeah. putting in some bolts yeah. or whatever, how does the... You know, so, the, the hybrid robot know when so, so yeah, he so or what, she's done it. It's a good question. So what we, what we do, the way we do it is the, once the operator fits the first part, he then presses start, and we've tuned the robot in, so the speed that the robot foot goes is a little bit slower than the operator. So the operator's then always ahead of the robot as All he goes right. through it. So it takes a bit of setting up, uh, yeah. but once, once it's in, it's good, it works well. What happens if the operator has a bit of a hold-up? So the, the robot will just stop. Yeah. Yeah. So the operator can either pause the robot or you can just touch the robot and it'll stop. Yeah. And then you can just, there. Yeah. Just and, you can, it and you can just restart them. Yeah. yeah. And you just press go and, and away it'll go. It'll follow the rest of its program on. Got um, it. So yeah. So a lot of investment's gone in uh, across the site in these. Um, we've put about 15 of them in in the last 12 months. Uh, the collaborative robots. So. Um, and that's on top of the big, uh, big investments we've had in the automation as well, which we'll probably see as we go, go throughout the process. So, Andrew, we're moving yeah. to our third area. Where do we find ourselves now? Yeah, so we're now at the point where we fit the pistons into the engine. So this is known as piston stuffing. Right. Uh, piston stuffing? Piston stuffing. I that's like what, it. That's what I the like it. <laughs> So this is one of our oldest bits of kit in the plant. Um, this is probably from about late 1990s. Yeah. Uh, it's been retooled since, um, but good, re reliable piece of equipment. Um, basically what we do, we pick, uh, we, we clamp, uh, lift and rotate the blocks, uh, and then the operators, it's one operator either side of the engine, one pushes the con rod through, yeah. one puts the cap on and the bolt on the other side. All right. So it's, uh, it's an interesting process. Yeah, uh, tried and tested. I'm going to uh, say, well, you know, it's been like that for yeah. a couple of decades uh, now. So. And it's one of the ones that we've talked about automating in the past, but we do such a variety of engines, all sorts of different sizes. Um, it's something that's really, really hard to automate. And yeah. This is where the, the dexterity of people comes into its own. And, um, that's it. Yeah, it's, it's, I suppose not, it, not everything can be automated, can it? No, and that's always one of the challenges that we get in an industry like this. We're always, you know, we're always encouraged to automate where we can to improve quality and safety and, and our efficiency. But some of the stuff is just, you know, robots just can't do it. That's yeah. where you need the people. Uh, and there's a fine balance between, you know, a successful piece of automation and getting the operators to do, uh, to do a good job for us. So, That's it. Uh, and this is one of those areas. So before we get to the, uh, the pist piston stuffing yep. process, yep. <laughs> Just behind you there, we've, yep. got, uh, we've got a bit of sub-assembly going on. Yeah, so there's a sub-assembly area in the background here. 
Um, so obviously every different engine that we get will have different pistons, different piston rings. Yeah. Um, a lot of the con rods are common. Um, obviously not between the nine and the six cylinder, but between the, the four and the six, we use shared, yeah. shared components a lot of the time. Um, but what, the, what happens here is the operators get a, a kit sheet from our, our IT system that tells them what parts to uh, put together in, in to, uh, to build the pistons up. Uh, and it also associates that, that, those pistons with that engine. Right. Um, so that sub assembly piece is done in the background. Uh, the bearing shells go in. Um, we've got the, the uh, piston rings go on there. Uh, the caps are loosened. Uh, some of these are practice split, so they have to stay in the right sequence. Yeah. Uh, and then they're delivered round in this in this form as, a, as an assembled piston, ready to go inside the engine, right. ready to be stuffed in the engine. And you, <laughs> I love that term. And you say cam rods are pretty similar between yeah. you know the engines, depending on which side yeah. it is. What does what's your part that varies the most? I mean, do the heads are they a different? Mo I mean, yeah. Yeah, there are there are different piston heads in there. Um, the, the part that varies the most actually is the piston rings. Right. Um, so you can have a similar head, um, but you, the rings will be different depending on the engine performance and, yeah. and things like that. So obviously the higher the performance of the engine, the higher the grade of the piston ring needs to be. So you can see around the other side, I think at the moment we've got about 40 or 50 different piston rings. Uh, and obviously there's a combination of that that will be introduced in. Oh, uh, it, and yeah. as we bring more product into the into the plant, yeah. that, that proliferation of those parts grows as well. Well, that's it. Something like your 6.7 litre engine, that yeah. has to go from like 150 horse yeah. all the way up to 320 yeah, odd. Exactly. It's yeah. gonna different stresses, yeah. different loads, yeah, different duty the, cycles. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the duty cycles make a big difference. Um, the power obviously makes a big difference. So. You know, we have to we have to account for all of that yeah. through our process, and, and that's one of the things that makes us quite successful at Darlington is we, we can pretty much build anything for anyone, yeah. um, and, and that's one of the big uh, big selling points of the, the plant. Spot on, right? This will move on, eh? Yep, let's move on.